all the dignitaries and dear participants, greetings of the day. It is a great pleasure for me that I got a chance to introduce about uh, an eminent uh, researcher, Deep Jariwala. Deep Jariwala is an uh, assistant professor in Department of Electrical and Systems Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. His research interests broadly lie at the interaction of new materials, surface science, and solid state devices for computing, sensing, optoelectronics, and energy harvesting applications. Deep completed his undergraduate degree in metallurgical engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Banaras Hindu University in 2010. Deep went on to pursue a PhD, a degree in material science and engineering at Northwestern University. Deep's research has earned him awards of multiple professional societies, including the Russell and uh, Sigurd Varian Award and Paul H. Holloway Award of the American Vacuum Society, the Richard L. Green Digitation Award of the American Physical Society, the, Ar uh, the Army Research uh, Office and Office of uh, Naval Research Young Investigator Awards, Nanomaterial Young Investigator Award, Intel Rising Star Award, IEEE Jung Electrical Engineer of the Year Award, IEEE Photonics Society Jung Investigator Award, IUPAP Early Career Scientist Prize in Semiconductors, in addition to being named in Forbes magazine list of 30 scientists under 30s in um, a scientific community. He is uh, an invitee to the Frontiers of Engineering Conference uh, of the National Academy of Engineering as well as a recipient of the Sloan Fellowship. In addition, he has also received the um, most prestigious award, uh, Reed Warren uh, Junior Award, given to one of the faculty members every year at the Penn Engineering uh, for inspiring and motivating undergraduate students uh, through teaching. He also serves as uh, uh, Associate Editor for IEEE Photonics Technology Letters, as well as uh, NPJ 2D materials and applications. He has published over 100 journal papers uh, with more than 15,000 citations and seven patents. At Penn, he leads a research group comprising more than 10 graduate and postdoctoral researchers supported by a variety of uh, government agencies, industries, and private foundations. Uh, it is a matter of uh, proud for us that uh, today uh, Professor Deep will be delivering a talk on the topic strong light matter interactions in low dimensional stringic semiconductors. Now I invite Professor Deep to deliver his talk. Professor Deep, please. Thank you so much for again for inviting me and, uh, uh, and for giving me this very kind introduction. Um, uh, so as uh, Professor Singh mentioned, uh, uh, the title of my talk is uh, strong light matter interactions in low dimensional excitonic semiconductors and so uh, without further ado let me get started and talk a little bit about the research uh, that i'm proposing to talk about but before i do that let me give a very broad and brief overview of our research lab so our research lab has um, uh, uh, is presents in many different research areas and uh, it is divided into various different subgroups. Uh, one of the major area of research, which I won't be talking about today, is nanoelectronics. This pertains to the, the uh, understanding uh, fabrication and characterization of electronic devices, such as transistors or memory devices, from uh, low dimensional materials uh, for next generation electronic applications. And this is a very, very active area of research, but it is not related to the topics of the ROSE, uh, 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 the ROSE conference or online uh, webinar series. Uh, 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 but the other areas uh, in the group are uh, nanophotonics and optoelectronics. This is the most relevant area to ROSE. And so most of my talk today will be in this area. And there are several publications we have had in this area recently. Uh, similarly, we are, I will also, if time permits, uh, talk a little bit about the functional imaging area in this case. Uh, Namely, we do tip enhanced Raman imaging. Uh, so, so, this kind of uh, tip enhanced Raman and luminescence imaging. So, this is also something that we pursue in the lab, and we have some uh, interesting results in this that were recently published that I will cover if time permits. 
And the last area of the group, which we are still pretty young in, but they are slowly trying to expand, is growth and synthesis. In this case, we are trying to grow and synthesize two-dimensional semiconductors over large areas via metal organic chemical vapor deposition. OK, so to get started, let me introduce low-dimensional axonic materials, what I mean by low-dimensional axonic materials. Now, these are not new materials. They have been known for a very long time. In particular, uh, the field of excitonic materials started with three, five quantum wells and epitaxial quantum dots several, several years ago, at almost two, three decades ago, when people managed to make gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide quantum well structures. In those structures, uh, because of the quantum confinement, excitons started dominating the optical properties, at least at low temperatures, right? And people were able to study exciton phenomena. Later on, Organic small molecules and polymers, which are also semiconducting, were isolated. These, due to their naturally molecular nature, exhibited strong confinement of excitons and therefore became dominant excitonic materials for a while. In fact, they went on to become commercial. And nowadays, we all know that uh, organic LEDs are there in all the smartphones, right? For example, all smartphone displays are OLED displays. Later on, even colloidal nanocrystals were found to be excitonic. And then carbon nanotubes, which are very popular one-dimensional conductors, these were researched about two decades ago. They are also strongly excitonic. And we still work on carbon nanotubes, though I will present very, very short, maybe just one slide of results on carbon nanotubes. But more recently, what has happened is two-dimensional materials have become the center of attention, namely two-dimensional chalcogenides and two-dimensional perovskites. These are also naturally quantum-confined materials, and therefore they are low-dimensional. And because of this quantum confinement or low-dimensionality, they support excitons, or excitons dominate their optical properties. So what I'm going to try and do is mainly talk about these two classes of materials and then, if time permits, I'll talk a little bit about nanotubes and give a little bit of introduction on the, the on, on the scanning probe uh, uh, work that we're doing now for Raman imaging. Okay, so before I get started, let me talk about what is special about 2D semiconductors. What makes 2D semiconductors unique over other semiconductors, other low-dimensional semiconductors that have been discovered earlier? Well, there are several points that make them unique. The first three points over here in black are what makes them unique electronically, OK? So when we talk about electronic applications of 2D semiconductors, we want to consider that there are no other semiconductors that can be so uniform as them and can be so thin as them over large scale, OK? And because they have Van der Waals bonding out of plane and covalent bonding in plane, they are easy to transfer from one substrate to another, and therefore, for vertical integration, in microelectronics, they are actually quite beneficial. And finally, the third point, which stems from the first two points, is that they present very, very high electronic quality at thicknesses smaller than one nanometer. This is not true for, say, silicon or gallium arsenide or any other three uh, bulk material. But as you thin them down, the material quality degrades. But from an optics perspective or photonics perspective, the reason these 2D semiconductors are quite interesting and unique is because of this last point written in green, is they have very large, they have strongly excitonic, and they have tunable optical constants, okay? At least from some of the 2D materials that I'm going to talk about. What do I mean by optical constants? I mean by refractive index and extinction coefficient or absorption coefficient, right? These are two fundamental optical constants of every material, the real and imaginary part of refractive index or epsilon one and epsilon two, right? And so let's try and look at how do these uh, materials uh, look like structurally and how do their optical constants look like, OK? So the materials I'll be focusing most of my talk on are called as TMDCs, transition metal dichalcogenides, OK? They have the following formula, MX2. M stands for metal, which is moly or tungsten. X stands for chalcogen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium. They are layered compounds like this, OK? The most, one which is most prototypical is molybdenum disulfide. 
it's a uh, it's a mineral you can actually mine it from the ground as molybdenite right and it comes as this layered compound each of these layers have one a sandwich of hexagonally packed metal atoms surrounded by two charcoal atoms on either side because of these weak van der waals bonding you can exfoliate them you can peel them out into individual atomic layers okay so the reason we got interested in them is because they are semiconducting in nature right semiconducting materials are important for all optoelectronics and electronic technologies so we started thinking about them that if they are semiconductors what is their band gap and what is their ability to harvest light this is how my group and i got interested in them so what we found out is actually they have a band gap very close to the part of the spectrum which is about 1.34 electron volts that is ideal for solar light harvesting okay and so when we started comparing all the photovoltaic semiconductors with these tmdc's we found that not only they have the right optical constant but they have some of the largest absorption coefficient in the visible part of the spectrum as compared to all other photovoltaic semiconductors they are even more absorbing than perovskites 10 times more than gallium arsenide 100 times more than silicon right so they are really very good materials in terms of light absorption right in the visible part of the spectrum which is where you want them to be but more importantly when you start looking at their optical constants more closely you find out that even in the bulk form okay, so if i take a bulk crystal of these materials due to the van der waals bonding the wave functions are so well isolated that the optical spectra are still dominated by excitons over here okay. so if you look at the uh, for example this is the optical constant of bulk ws2 crystal you can see how wavy the optical function is right this is k or extinction coefficient this is n the interesting thing to note over here is that n or refractive index is actually quite large it's more than 4 okay 4 is a very large number for a refractive index and it stays more than 4 even below the absorption edge which is where the absorption or a k goes to 0 right so it stays more than 4 even above that which is quite remarkable okay so we thought this is a great opportunity to use this material which is high n and high k to trap or absorb large proportion of light within it The other reason this material is exciting is the excitons in these materials are tunable. How come they are tunable? Well, they are tunable from the perspective of physical structure. When you have sim simple monolayers of these materials, the excitons are very tightly bound. They have very strong binding energy. Okay, so there is a large difference in energy between the excitons and the bulk density of states band gap. However, when you go to three dimensional or you know multi layers. the excitons the electric field in the excitons gets screened however because of the van der waals nature they still retain most of their oscillator strength therefore the uh, optical properties are still dominated by excitons although the 3d density of states gap is not too far away from them now okay but still as you will see in their optical response the excitons dominate the optical properties this is also evident if you look at the binding energy of excitons compared with the optical band gap of several excitonic semiconductors you see that all these 2d semiconductors as uh, which is chalcogenite as well as halide perovskites here they dominate the exciton binding energy spectrum okay they are much much larger than room temperature thermal energy which is right here all of the 3 5 semiconductors they are sitting right here which is at or below room temperature thermal energy the other thing which is quite interesting about them and just as i showed you in the previous slide the optical constant of these materials are highly tunable how come they are highly tunable well they are highly tunable because they are very very thin materials if you apply a voltage to them or apply electric field across them you can move the fermi level in these materials if you move the fermi level the uh, refractive index and the extinction coefficient can both be modulated as a function of voltage right In fact, the modulation of as high as 40% can be achieved in these materials near the exciton, as I'm showing you over here. This is a very large number. To give you a sense, for those of you who do modulation in silicon or gallium arsenide, the modulation is less than 0.1% as compared to these materials, in which case it goes to 40%. So, for optical modulator type applications, these materials would be amazing 
provided we can make them in large enough areas and integrate them or fabricate them into the right shapes. Okay, so this motivated us to explore coupling between excitons in this material, as I've been explaining you, the excitons in the materials are quite unique and quite fascinating, and just photons that are being shined on this material, right? So coupling between excitons and photons is not a new subject either. It has been known for 30 years. In the traditional 3-5 semiconductor material or quantum well material, people used to make these quantum wells and they would potentially grow dark barrels on either side of the quantum well to trap light or photons in between them. So when you trap the photon and uh, uh, along with the quantum well that also harbors an exciton, then you allow them to strongly interact. So you allow the photon to strongly interact with the exciton, forming a couple or a hybrid light matter state known as exciton polariton. Okay. These exciton polaritons were of the subject of, a, of study for many, many years. Even today, people are studying them in the context of finding new Bose-Einstein condensates, right? So polaritons are bosons, extrons are also bosons, and photons are also bosons. So it has been shown that they could form Bose-Einstein condensate, and such polaritonic Bose-Einstein condensate could have the ability to induce lasing at a much lower threshold as compared to the standard photon laser, right? And so people have been focused for many years now in order to build polaritonic lasing devices with ultra high efficiency or ultra low threshold power. This has of course been difficult to achieve because in 3-5 materials, the binding energy of the extrons are very low. So they could only operate at low temperature and even there the efficiency was not very good. With the availability of these Van der Waals two dimensional materials with large binding energy, you could now achieve this probably at room temperature but more importantly, you are no longer limited to this Bragg mirror type structure for confining the photon. Because these materials can be easily isolated into individual monolayers, they are essentially freestanding excitonic quantum wells. You can integrate them with any other optical cavity. Optical cavities such as plasmonic cavities, dielectric cavities, photonic nanocrystal cavities, things like that. And people have done that to see very large rabbi splitting even at room temperatures, okay? So this kind of work has been pursued by many, many groups all over the world. We are not the only groups pursuing it. For example, the strong light matter coupling in these materials. There are many groups I've listed over here. We have also written a review paper on this, uh, which is here in ACS Nano, published in 2021, which has summarized all of this research. You're welcome to take a look at it. But let me get into the research part. So knowing that these materials are the optical property of these materials are dominated by excitons and also knowing that uh, they have very large refractive indices we decided to trap light into them efficiently so to trap light in them efficiently we have to use a clever trick the clever trick is that use the mismatch in refractive indices between the material and the substrate so if you have just freestanding tmdc layers that are very very thin most of the light will either go through it, and if you have them too thick, most of the light will get reflected because of the mismatch in refractive index. Okay, but if you have thin layers of these materials sitting on reflective material like gold or silver, as the light comes in, it undergoes a large phase propagation due to the high refractive index and extinction coefficient of this material. And as it bounces back from behind and goes to the top surface, it could cause non destructive interference sorry, destructive interference at the top interface over here, leading to a resonant absorption in the material, okay? So using this very simple technique of placing very thin layers of this material on reflective gold or silver substrate, you could get nearly 100% absorption. You don't need any kind of nano fabrication or fabrication of any kind of optical cavity to induce it. The material itself is the cavity medium now, okay? This is the key observation that we made, which is profound over here. The material itself can be the optical cavity medium. Okay. So to prove this, of course, you will exfoliate or we transferred or exfoliated some of these uh, two-dimensional semiconductor material, namely tungsten diselenide, onto gold or silver substrates. You can see that even for very, very small thicknesses, you can see very bright colors in them. For 30 nanometer thickness, for example, you can see it nearly black in color. 
Okay, this tells you that it is absorbing most of the light. In fact, if you measure the optical spectrum or reflection spectrum from these layers, you can see that they absorb nearly 100% of the light for 30 nanometer thickness. Okay. In fact, if we do a calculation of the same, this is using simple transfer matrix calculation, which is uh, your solution of Maxwell's equation in one dimension, you can very easily see that uh, most of the light uh, or these, uh, uh, these calculations agree very, very well with experiments. And most of the light is actually useful absorption, which is this dashed line. Most of the light is actually going inside the semiconductor and not in the metal, right? So this was a great opportunity for us to use these very, very thin light absorbers and very strong light absorbers for, for example, photovoltaic applications. So we did a lot of work in the area of making ultra thin photovoltaics. Typically, people make photovoltaic cells from silicon or gallium arsenide, which are several microns in thickness. Even the organic solar cells that many people make and even the perovskite solar cells that many people make, they are also a few hundred nanometers in thickness. Our solar cells are less than 10 nanometers in thickness. Still, they absorb more than 90% of the light and are able to produce more than 50% of external quantum efficiency, about 3 to 4% of power conversion efficiency. We published a number of papers in this topic of photovoltaics from 2D semiconductors like very, very thin photovoltaics. They have unique applications in space, for example, because of their very, very lightweight. These are old papers over here that I'm putting out. You're welcome to take a look at them. In today's talk, I won't be covering this. There is also a YouTube video specifically on a one-hour talk on photovoltaics from 2D materials that I delivered at another university. You're welcome to take a look at that as well. But what I would like to focus on in today's talk is the strong interaction between the excitons and the photon. So if you go back to our previous picture over here and try to investigate that what happens in this resonant light trapping structure when the exciton and photon both interact closely. So to understand that, we started measuring these reflectance spectra as a function of thickness. So take the example of tungsten disulfide again. Tungsten disulfide in the bulk or at large thicknesses, it has very nice one exciton at two electron volts, roughly two electron volts. So at these excitons, you see a nice dip in reflectance in the reflectance spectrum. But as you keep reducing the thickness while it is on a gold or silver substrate, you see that beyond a certain critical thickness of about 15 nanometers or so, the exciton splits. The exciton splits into two different peaks, okay? And you can also see that there is the splitting keeps changing as you keep reducing the thickness further. In fact, it forms a full new dispersion. And this dispersion is formed by the intersection of this linear mode over here, known as fabry perot or a cavity mode with the exciton mode over here. So this is the photonic mode. This is the excitonic mode. And the intersection or interaction between the them splits the dispersion relation, right? You can also see this very, very well experimentally, actually. And when you take the experimental spectra and put it on the calculations, you see that they match very, very well. These circles are experimental spectra. In fact, you can also use a simple two-coupled oscillator model and fit it to this nice dispersion relation, right? And at room temperature under ambient conditions, you could get very nice splitting over here, about 170 milli electron volt. Right? You can even explore higher orders of splitting by going to larger and larger thicknesses. So for smaller thicknesses, I showed you, we see some splitting. But as you go to larger thicknesses, you trap larger and larger orders of fabry perot cavity modes uh, or higher order modes. And as you can see, the splitting keeps on increasing. Okay. So this is not unique to, to just WS2. It can happen in WSC2. It can happen in MOS2. It can happen in MOSC2 and all other extronic semiconductors as well. Okay. It is also not unique to just gold. It can happen on silver, aluminum, essentially any reflective substrate. In fact, on aluminum, you can see the splitting is actually quite significant, all right? But it does not happen for traditional three-dimensional semiconductors, such as gallium phosphide or gallium arsenide, which have similar band gaps and uh, similar optical constants, but they do not have the extra. The lack of optical density of states in the nexitonic feature prevents them from strong light matter coupling or splitting like we have seen for the case of these two dimensional semiconductors. So the next thing what we have done in them is actually you've taken these 
two dimensional semiconductors and pattern them or nano pattern them. When you nano pattern them, you break the symmetry in plane. And so you make these grating like structures in these TMDCs again on gold substrates. And in these grating like structures, you see emergence of plasmon polaritons, right? You only see these emergence of plasmon polaritons along one direction along which symmetry is broken, which is the TM polarized direction. Along TE polarized direction, you don't see any symmetry breaking. And so you see emergence of these new peaks, which are marked by these uh, triangles and squares over here. And uh, when you do the simulations, you can find out that these are indeed class one polaritons because their electric fields are localized at the interface between a tungsten disulfide and the gold. In fact, you can see them very nicely experimentally as well. Experimentally, these values of these new peaks end up matching really well to the calculations that we are showing over here. In fact, here is, for example, as you change the width of these grating resonators, you can see how the dispersion relation of these uh, 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 exciton plasmon polaritons, three-way hybrid particles, changes. You can see first order, second order, third order plasmons image, uh, emerging as you change the width of the resonators over here. Okay. So all this is good demonstration and good fundamental science, but we wanted to ask a more deeper question. We managed to do this kind of light trapping in relatively thicker materials. If you look at the thickness of this material over here, it's still about 10 to 15 nanometers in which we are able to do this strong light matter coupling. What about monolayers, right? Monolayers are actually more valuable, more important. Why? Well, because they are perfectly two dimensional, okay? Not only because they are perfectly two dimensional, but when you go from multi layers to monolayer structure, you undergo a band gap transition due to loss of symmetry and quantum confinement. Okay, this band gap transition goes from indirect to direct band gap transition. As a result, you also have these materials that are more emissive in nature because of the direct nature of the band gap. Second, because monolayers are very thin less than one nanometer in thickness, you can modulate the optical dielectric function really well. This gives you the ability to tune the exciton and make other types of devices, such as optical modulators, for example, right? But the hard part is that in monolayers, the thickness is really, really small. It is really less than one nanometer in thickness. How do you get light to be absorbed very strongly in less than one nanometer of the material? This is the hard problem, right? So when I posed this problem to my students, and I told them to try to come up with a structure where electronically these materials behave like monolayers, but optically they still behave like multilayers. So they came up with this kind of a structure, a super lattice structure. The students told me that if you separate individual monolayers with spacer materials, spacer materials are essentially insulating materials, such as hexagonal boron nitride or aluminum oxide you will maintain electronic isolation of these layers such that the wave functions won't interact with each other. And therefore electronically it will stay as a monolayer, but optically it will stay like a multi-layer. And in fact, the mismatch in refractive index will allow you to bounce light within the structure many, many, many times, leading it to trapping the light quite closely. Okay. So we managed to simulate the structure then figure out that for spacer thicknesses as small as three nanometers, you should be able to achieve a very high degree of light confinement in this kind of an artificial super lattice or multi quantum well structure. In fact, we were able to see that even for a number of unit cells of just six, you can trap nearly 100% light in the exciton for these materials without the need of any external optical cavity. So then I asked my students to go and make these kind of structures. So they started making this kind of structure in the lab by stacking multiple layers of 2D materials. Very quickly, they came back to me and said that, Professor, we cannot do this because this is very hard. Why is it very hard? Because if you keep stacking crystals one on top of the other, the overlapping area between the crystals keep producing, eventually leading you to the a size of the sample that is unusable. Okay. So this is where we decided to take our approach to a large area, scalable material, okay? So this is something that I want to tell to the entire community. Two dimensional materials are no longer lab scale experimental materials. They can be grown over very large areas, two inch to eight inch wafers, very uniformly 
Okay, here we are growing them on sapphire wafers. We get these samples from Professor Jones Red Wings group at, at uh, Penn State University. And similarly, sapphire can also be grown over very large areas with very, uh, or sorry, hexagonal boron nitrate can also be grown on sapphire over very large areas with very uniform control and thickness. In fact, companies like Extron have been growing it over eight inch wafers. So now they are truly approaching commercial scale production and people are making, uh, putting them into commercial foundries to make many, very small devices out of them, especially in the electronic space. So I want to tell to the community that two dimensional materials are no longer limited to the lab. They are close, slowly and slowly approaching uh, practical applications because of the size at which you can make them. Okay. So using these large area materials, we have made these artificially uh, constructed all inorganic Van der Waals multi quantum wells. Okay. By transferring one layer after another over centimeter scale, we have been able to build this structure. And you can see over here in this slide that as we increase the total number of N or number of layers in the structure, the structure keeps becoming darker and darker. And by the time N equal reach N equals to eight, it's actually fairly dark, dark green to black in color, suggesting it is absorbing most of the light. You can even see this in the reflectance spectrum where you start seeing nearly 100% absorption for just five layers of the stack. If you look under an electron microscope, you'll see that these layers are actually very nicely layered, right? to stack one on top of the other, very similar to a multi-quantum well that would be a potentially grown. You can see alignment of all the atoms or all the elements over here accordingly. And even in the HRTM image, you can see the darker lines are the tungsten disulfide, whereas these intermediate lines in between are the hexagonal boron nitride with boron and nitrogen in between these layers, okay? But the more interesting thing about them is these layers are themselves light trapping agents or these multi-layer structure themselves light trapping agents. In particular, when you try and light at an angle in these layers for a particular polarization, the light can get trapped into these structures as a waveguide mode. And these waveguide mode can then interact with the excitonic mode beyond a certain angle, or when the wave vector is larger than a certain angle or a certain magnitude, and can lead to splitting of exciton polaritons. So you can actually see splitting of exciton polaritons emerge in experiments and in simulation, okay? Very well seen, both in experiment and in simulations, okay? So this tells you that we again have an external polaritonic material or a structure which strongly confines light to form external polaritons in this ultra thin limit or using monolayers. So where do we go from here? From here, what we wanna do is now we want to actively tune the external polaritons using applied voltages. So if you apply voltages and tune these optical constants, you should be able to undergo or allow the incoming light for its phase to be tuned as it leaves the sample. Okay. So what we want to now show is phase modulation as a, in, in the under reflection for light falling on the structure. And we've actually shown via simulations that you can get up to 180 degree phase tuning of the light as it bounces off of the sample. This could have tremendous applications in free space optical communications such as LIDAR or imaging or, or any or other optical modulator applications, even integrated optical modulator applications and things like that. So that is an interesting area we are going towards using this very simple super lattice structure. Moving on, I would also want to introduce to you natural quantum well super lattices. So far, we have looked at artificially made quantum well super lattices, but you can also make natural quantum well super lattices using lead halide perovskites. Lead halide perovskites are naturally occurring layered materials where you have alternating layers of the inorganic and the organic part. And they are also quantum well type in structure, and they occur in many, many different uh, orders, such as N equals one, two, three, four, five, depending on the thickness of the lead iodide layer, right? And so, what was difficult to do in these materials is to synthesize them in phase purity. Typically, when people would try to synthesize n equals to two, some amount of n equals to form of will, of one will inevitably form in them, and likewise for the other materials. What we have managed to do in collaboration with Professor Aritya Mohite's group at Rice University is we've been able to make these crystals in large enough areas and large and high enough phase purity 
that you can do the standard optical characterization experiment on them. So doing spectroscopic ellipsometry on them, we were able to quantify their optical constants to a high degree of accuracy, right? As you can see in these optical constants, going from n equals to 1 to n equals to 5 in these layers, you can see how strong the exciton dominates the optical dielectric function. Not only that it strongly dominate the optical dielectric function, but you can see that the quantum confinement and the external oscillator strength reduces as you reduce the quantum confinement but you, by going to a higher number of layers or a higher thickness of the layer diode. Right? This was also observed in the diode Jacobson phases of this material. Right? So for the first time, we were able to accurately quantify the dielectric functions of these materials and we were able to put them out online for everybody to use them. If you want to design a new optical device using these dielectric functions, they are now freely available online for you to take a look. In fact, if you look at the absorption coefficient of these materials, they are comparable to not only the TMDCs, but also some of the laser dye materials. So this makes them very good candidate for not only absorber, but also lasing applications, which is what we are after. But first things first, we wanted to see how well they can trap light. We can trap light in these materials, very similar to the light trapping in uh, uh, chalcogenides. And we were able to see that once again by placing them on gold substrates, we were able to trap very high degrees of light, nearly 100% light in them for very small thicknesses. In fact, for larger thicknesses, we were able to see external polaritons splitting in these materials quite well as you went to thicker and thicker layers. Once again, we were able to see this nice, strongly coupled external polariton dispersions appearing in these materials. But because these materials are so well isolated, they are also strongly emissive and they remain di direct band gap, whether they are in monolayer or multilayer form. And therefore, they also emit polaritons very efficiently. This emission of polaritons can be seen at room temperature in terms of upper polariton, higher order, and lower polariton emission, which is quite exciting because now we can think about making polariton lasers out of these materials. Okay. In fact, we were able to measure the full polaritonic dispersion in these materials via angle-dependent emission, both at room temperature and at 300 Kelvin. And we were able to see the full bends, uh, both at 300 Kelvin and at 4 Kelvin. And we were able to see this night, uh, nice dispersion relation where the polariton dispersions are bent. And you can see all the higher order polaritons as well in these structures at larger thicknesses. OK, uh, I will also mention that the coupling between the light and matter in these materials, the function of a degree of quantum confinement. So you can see that the rabbi splitting can be very large, and it obeys this relation where k is the extinction coefficient, which is largest for the most quantum confined material, and it reduces as you go to lower and lower quantum confined materials and fits this very nice line. Similarly, you can see these uh, occur quite well and match up well in both the reflectance as well as emission spectra. Uh, for these higher order perovskites right here, okay? And this is again an animation showing you that as you go to a uh, higher and higher order of perovskites, the rabbi splitting keeps reducing, but they are all still strongly coupled quite well. The last topic that I want to cover for lack of time is a very new topic that our group is exposing uh, or exploring, which is interaction of light with magnetic semiconductors, okay? People have explored light with magnetic materials for a very long time, right? But they are mostly magnetic metals. What we are trying to explore over here are anti-ferromagnetic materials, but semiconductors, okay? So very recently, people have found two-dimensional semiconductors where the spin alignment in them could be zigzag or it could be this Neal-type spin alignment, okay? And these materials are semiconducting materials. So iron phosphorus sulfide, manganese phosphorus sulfide are two examples. The zigzag type materials have a critical temperature of about 120 to 140 Kelvin, 120 to 160 Kelvin, right? Whereas these Neal type materials have much lower, uh, for example, transition temperatures. But because the spins align in the zigzag fashion, they show a very interesting optical effect, which is the optical linear dichroism. OK, so we wanted to explore how this optical linear dichroism in this material manifests as a function of thickness and as a function of magnetization. So the first observation we made in this regard is that this material exhibits very strong linear dichroism. 
and the linear dichroism is closely coupled to its transition temperature. As you cool down the material, the linear dichroism grows from just a few percentage, very high all the way to 100% as it goes through its transition temperature of about 120 Kelvin or so. This is remarkable because I think for the very first time people observed this very large linear dichroism which is coupled to the magnetization in the material. In fact, we did more careful experiments to look at this polarization at a low temperature, polarization angle, and you can see that for very specific angles, for very specific wavelengths, uh, you can see that the anisotropy is just very, very large. For example, over here, just above 800 nanometer or at 750 nanometer, you can see that the anisotropy is huge over here, as you can see in this polar plot, okay? So if you fix the wavelength, for example, uh, or, uh, for uh, over here at 750 nanometer, now vary the temperature, you can see that the linear dichroism varies from a very small value to a very large value over here. Right? This was quite unique, something that had not been seen before. Not only that, you can also tune the place where this linear dichroism occurs. It does not necessarily occur just at the, uh, at the absorption frequency but it can be tuned all the way across the spectrum just by tuning the thickness of the material. And so again, by doing simple transfer matrix theory, you can find out that the linear dichroism, the peaks in the linear dichroism are corresponding to the cavity modes. Okay, so the material itself is forming a cavity again. Okay, and when you have this cavity controlled linear dichroism tied to the ferromagnetic transition, right, you can tune the position of this near unity linear dichroism that you can see, right? This is quite remarkable. And now you have a thickness controlled, spectrally tuned material where linear dichroism is controlled by magnetization, right? You can again control these cavity sizes in many different ways by controlling the size of the material or thickness of the material itself or thickness of the substrate uh, that is lying on. And you can once again vary uh, 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 which part of the spectrum uh, you can achieve linear dichroism in a large, large linear dichroism, okay? So I think this is where I will end my talk. I have a few more slides, but I will skip over them. But one of the main slides I had was that we also work on carbon nanotubes, which can be made over very large areas. And one of the interesting things about carbon nanotubes is you can actually tune the optical dielectric function in them as a function of voltage, just like you could do for TMDCs or chalcogenides. But here now you can do it in the telecom uh, range of the spectrum, and you can actually have some of the most tunable optical constants in the telecom range from carbon nanotubes that you cannot even get with, for example, graphene, silicon, or indium phosphide. Okay, so I'm going to skip the rest of the slides because uh, I think I'm running out of time over here. But I would like to summarize and give a outlook on photonics using our strong light matter coupling in low-dimensional semiconductors, which is that layer 2D semiconductors as well as 1D carbon nanotubes have several key attributes that makes them very interesting avenues for strong light matter coupling, both for classical nanophotonics as well as quantum photonics. I did not talk much about quantum photonics, but we are working on these quantum dot-like structures from these materials where single photons come out, and we are using tips, uh, so tip-like structures, plasmonic tips to sample and measure where the emission is exactly coming from in the near field. But the reason they are quite exciting for all these nano and quantum photonic applications is they have high refractive index. They are easy to integrate and fabricate. They support excitons. Their index is tunable, and they have high nonlinearity. It is very, very difficult to find all these five properties in the same class of materials. But fortunately, we have this in these two-dimensional materials, so I think there is have a huge promise in both nano and quantum photonics. The other important thing to remember over here is we have to scale up the growth and manufacturing of 2D semiconductors. You can do all the experiments that you want in the lab scale, but if you really want to make practical application of, the scale of them, you have to grow them over large areas on wafer scales. This is what I've been trying to show, and I've shown you one example of them, and also integrate them into complex repeating units. Right? This will be very important if you want to actually take them to applications. And finally, from a fundamental perspective, we want to use these materials or take their advantage to find new ways of actively tuning of optical properties. What can you do to have active control of light inside these materials? I showed you that magnetization can be a good example. Electric field, of course, is already very well known, but strain 
can also be a very good uh, way or mechanical strain would be very good way to introduce anisotropy and tune light in these materials actively. So that leads to magneto-optical MEMS devices, for example, uh, is, is one uh, new emerging area uh, where you can take this uh, or, or, or take this uh, field into, okay? So with that, I'd like to end and thank uh, all the very hardworking students and postdocs uh, whose efforts have led to all this wonderful research. Of course, none of the work gets done without funding from various funding agencies all over the world, but mostly the U.S. funding agencies, namely the Army Research Office, the Office of Naval Research, and the Air Force, uh, mostly Department of Defense, who fund our work, and many, many collaborators all over the world who uh, uh, openly collaborate with us and support us in our efforts, particularly Professor Arthur Davoyan of uh, UCLA, Mark Knight at Northrop Grumman, and Professor Joan Redwing at Penn State, and of course our partners at the Air Force Research Lab who also help us out with all kinds of materials. So with that, I'd like to thank you all again. Here are some of the papers we have published over the years, over the last two years. I'll mention that I've not covered any of the papers in the electronics domain. Again, this is not because it's not related to the topic of both webinar, I've mostly covered the papers that are presented here in photonics. I did want to present a little bit on imaging and microscopy, but I did not have enough time. And of course, we have also published several reviews which you can refer to. And thank you all once again. I'm happy to take any questions.